relative motion that I don't think hopefully will take too long. And then um, I'll do one of those chain rule problems, and I guess I'll I'll do it with a um, I'll I'll make it into a kinetics problem because you might as well. It's just uh, at the end you do the free body diagram and put it into Newton's second law. Okay, so let's say that um, let's see. So let's do one where, so let's say there's a truck. And is it moving fast? Very fast. It's just smoke. Um, Okay, so let's say so there's a box sitting here. And Okay, hold on. Hold on. Okay, so there's a box there. Uh and it's connected to a pulley, and another box is hanging here. Okay. All right, so let's say this is one kilogram, this is five kilograms. Um, The acceleration of the truck is uh, three meters per second squared, speeding up. And we want to know. Uh, what's the minimum coefficient of static friction so the five kilogram box doesn't slide? I think I might have taken all the relative motion out of this. I think we have to calculate that. This is a stupid problem. Let's come up with a better problem. Do this at home. Okay, um, we need one with relative motion, okay. So let's say, um, So you got an astronaut and um, yeah, it probably shoots out flames. Yeah, hot flames. Um, 
Okay, and let's say that this guy's doing like a spacewalk. This is better, I think. Okay, so the rocket's acceleration is zero, 10 meters per second squared, negative two meters per second squared. And the camera on the spaceship observes the astronaut's acceleration to be, um, say, 5 meters per second squared, 5 meters per second squared, 0. And let's say the astronaut with all his stuff on has a mass of 100 kilograms. What's the force applied to the astronaut by the arm? Okay. So this is like the same kind of problem. The steps are the same, except that we don't have to do the complicated circular motion stuff. Um, but we are going to have to do relative motion to come up with our acceleration relative to the ground. Um, yes, that's sort of what I'm trying to imply here. Um, so the rocket's acceleration with respect to um, an inertial coordinate system. So we don't care what that is, but what? Uh, we don't care where it is. We just know it's inertial. So on the surface of the Earth, it's more or less inertial. It depends how accurate you want. Um, for almost any measurement, you can use the surface of the Earth as, a, as an inertial coordinate system, but it will screw up really very sensitive measurements um, because of the rotation. OK, so uh, first we need the acceleration. So first find the astronauts. acceleration with respect to the inertial coordinate system. So um, the inertial coordinate system, I'm still going to call the ground. Um, so the acceleration of the astronaut with respect to the ground is equal to the acceleration of the astronaut with respect to the spaceship plus the acceleration of the spaceship with respect to the ground. So the acceleration of the astronaut with respect to the spaceship is what the camera fixed on the spaceship observes. So that's 5, 5, 0. The acceleration of the spaceship relative to the ground was given as 0, 10, negative 2. So you get a total of 5, 15, negative 2. Um, I 
And so now the free body diagram Okay, there's the astronaut. <laughs> That's not my best drawing. Um, so what forces are acting? Well, usually you'd include weight. I guess this is in space, so maybe there's no weight. Um, so all we have is the force on the astronaut by the arm. And so now Newton's second law says the force on the astronaut by the arm is equal to the mass of the astronaut times this acceleration we just calculated. So 500 newtons, 1500 newtons, negative 200 newtons. Everyone's just like looking at me like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> um, maybe I'm misinterpreting. I hope I'm misinterpreting that. But, um, what? Um, okay, let's do, let's do one of those chain rule problems, and I'll turn that into a kinetics problem, so we use Newton's second law, too. So, um, let's do a helix one. Yeah. Okay, so let's say that um, so let's say that the helix is like you know, and this is the x-axis, y-axis, z-axis is coming out. Um, and let's say that the position vector is parametrized by, and okay, let's say it's going this way, okay? In the practice problem, it was going up instead of down, and it was also uh, the upward direction was parallel to the z-axis. This time it's the y-axis, so we'll see what things change there. You might want to like go back and compare this to that practice problem. Um, okay, so let's say that uh, we have cosine of y, y, sine of y. Okay, so there's the position. And let's say the speed is increasing um, so let's say it's equal to 0.5 t. Okay, so it's speeding up. 
0.5. Oh, no, let's not do it in terms of time. Let's do it in terms of y. So let's say 0.5y. And that should be what? Yeah, thanks. So the speed, well, you can't have negative speed. Uh, let's see. If it's speeding up as y gets smaller, then we need to have... Uh, Let's just go 10 minus y. All right, so we want to figure out what's the force, the net force. applied to a one kilogram object to make it follow this path. All right, so um, we have to figure out the acceleration. And then we have to use Newton's second law with the acceleration to figure out the force. Um, The acceleration is going to be, uh, well, we know that it's the time derivative of the velocity vector, right? But we don't have anything in terms of time, so we have to do this using the chain rule. So this is going to be dv, d, we have everything in terms of y, so this is going to be dv dy times dy dt. <coughs> And dy dt is the y component of the velocity vector. All right, so um, To come up with the velocity vector, we know that that's equal to the speed times a unit vector in the direction of the path. And we know that to come up with, it won't be a unit vector yet, but to come up with a vector in the direction of the path, we can take the derivative of this just with respect to its parameter. So you get negative sine 1 cosine this is in the direction of increasing y because that's just what you get when you take the derivative with respect to the parameter you get the, you get a tangent vector in the direction of the increasing parameter. Since, um, since the path of our object is in the direction of the decreasing value of y, right, since it's going down, um, um, a vector that's in the direction of our particle's path is actually positive sine, negative 1, negative cosine. Okay? So... And now uh, we need to come up with a unit vector in this direction. So the magnitude of this vector is 
sine squared y plus 1 squared plus cosine squared, square root. Uh, yeah, they would because it's not, you're not changing the value of the, um, of the parameter. You're changing the direction of the vector. So you're just multiplying that vector by negative 1. Okay, so we have this nice thing that happens here. Sine squared y plus cosine squared y is equal to 1. So we end up with just square root of 2 is the magnitude. And so the unit vector in the direction of the path is sine y over root 2, 1 over root 2, uh, negative 1 over root 2, sorry, and then negative cosine y over root 2. And so now, um, finally, our velocity vector is just the speed times this. So we get 10 minus y times sine y over root 2. Then negative 10 minus y over root 2. And then negative 10 minus y times cosine y over root 2. So now to take to get the acceleration, um, we have um, we want derivative of the velocity vector with respect to y times the y component. Um, so derivative of the x component of the velocity vector with respect to y is uh, negative 1 sine y plus 10 minus y cosine y. That's the product rule all over root 2. And then derivative of the y component with respect to y is just 1 over root 2. And then the z component, we have uh, cosine y plus 10 minus y times the sine of y divided by root 2. Okay, so that is dv dy. Then we have to multiply it by the y component of the velocity, so that's this thing. <clears throat> so that's not the most beautiful thing ever, but there we have an expression for the acceleration of the particle as a function of y. That's the hard part of this, so anybody have any questions about any of the steps up until here? Now you could simplify it a little bit, um, but I don't really care if you do that.
I don't care at all if you do that on tests and stuff. Um, so now once we have the acceleration, we're done with the right side of Newton's second law. So now the free body diagram, since we're just trying to find the net force on this object, the free body diagram just looks like this. You know, we lump all the forces together into a single thing. And so Newton's second law says F net is equal to the mass times the acceleration vector as a function of z. That's from the last page. And so since, since the mass is one kilogram, to get the force, you're just multiplying this by one. So this is also an expression for the, uh, for the force, the net force in Newtons. <laughs> and this, you know, a function like this doesn't mean much to you until you, like if you plotted it, you'd get a sense of how that force is changing over time. Um, Any questions about anything on there? All right, so, um, yeah, I think the, the trickiest things to make sense out of for the test on Thursday are going to be relative motion, circular motion, and that chain rule stuff, you know. Those are going to be the hardest three things, and especially when they, when they get you know, put on top of each other in the same problem. Um, so, all right, well, that's it. Uh, I guess tomorrow, if, if you have more questions as you go through the practice problems, I'd be happy to answer some questions, but we're also going to move on to the next step.